If the current operating system for society is failing, what could an alternative look like? In 2013, Jim Rutt, the former chairman of the world-renowned Santa Fe Institute, brought together a group of renegade thinkers for a series of meetings in Stanton, Virginia, to try to answer that question. The team ranged from complexity theorists to culture hackers and evolutionary biologists, all united by a conviction that the current system was unsustainable and probably self-terminating. When I arrived at the Stanton meetings, the framing surrounded the shared recognition that I think characterized everybody in the room that civilization was on a dangerous track. Some of us believed the track to be fatal in the near term. Initially, the plan was to create a new political party, the Emancipation Party. Over time, that shifted onto a different project, how to change the culture. It gained a title, Game B. Why do you think that name particularly stuck? If you're unhappy with the status quo, then Game B has to be what the status quo isn't. Uh, so better the devil I don't know than the devil I know. But in 2014, the project stalled. Jim Rutt said it went into spore mode. Recently, some of these spores have germinated with a new surge of interest in Game B. So what can be learned from what happened to the original project? I'd love if you could tell the story, like fairly concisely, but the story of Game B from the Emancipation Party to the meetings at Staunton, just as a sort of broad overview, and then we'll, dip, we'll kind of delve down into the details of it. All right, it goes back a little further to a, a document I wrote in, I think I published it April uh, 2012, and I invited some people to read it and critique it, uh, and it developed some momentum and resulted in a meeting in Stanton, Virginia in September 2012, where we, you know, seven or eight people said, what are we gonna do? You know, the world needs changing. Uh, my document was mostly about a new monetary system, but also included a new financial system, uh, some ideas about new political systems, etc. And we decided, for better or for worse, to start a new political party, right? We didn't know dick about political parties. Uh, and uh, we decided we'd start one anyway. And uh, we started having, we we're strong believers that face-to-face -face was where real stuff happened. I've long expressed the doctrine that there's a distinction between weak links and strong links. Weak links is mostly what you get online, though sometimes you get strong links from online. And strong links are mostly what you get face-to-face, -face, so you can get weak links face-to-face -to -face too. But anyway, we decided to meet regularly every six to eight weeks to do whatever it was we were going to do, and they became a series of meetings known as Stanton 1 through 5. And uh, so the first one, we decided we're going to launch a party. Uh, I don't even know if we came up with the name at that point, but somewhere soon thereafter, we came up with the name Emancipation Party. Uh, we created uh, a series of reforms, uh, and we uh, decided that we were going to call for a debt jubilee. Uh, interesting, all, all that stuff, at least the later version of it, the January 2013 version of it, still up on the emancipationparty.org website, if anybody's interested in looking at it. So anyway, I think in... Late November, early December, we launched the party out, marketed it to people we knew and whatever. Again, we were incompetent. Fairly quickly, we got a couple hundred people to join. And uh, we decided to make it like a 19th century European party where you had to pay dues, $20 a month. And, but we also allowed people to optionally select, I can't afford 20, I'll pay five. Uh, as part of the model to avoid having to depend on fundraising and you know, money bags, right? Uh, and so we quickly raised a couple, got a couple hundred people in, and then in January we took stock of where we were. And we said, hmm, we did pretty good with baby boomers, good enough that uh, from an early test marketing perspective it would say proceed. Uh, with Gen Xers, we did about half as well as we did with boomers, which uh, from our marketing uh, experience would have said, probably improvable by fine tuning over a period of time to make it good enough to launch. And you often find uh, you know, version 0 0.8 products that the early marketing doesn't quite make sense, but it's close enough that you believe you can tweak it over a few months and get it to make sense. Millennial, millennials, there weren't Zs yet, millennials were a complete washout. We did not get a single millennial to join, not one. And we went back and talked to some millennials and uh, it was quite uniform that the idea of a political party was anathema. 
it was as if you had said, cat shit, right? The Emancipation Party, cat shit. And even though the reforms, as you'll see, are very progressive and millennial friendly, things like uh, what we'd now call Medicare for, for all, UBI, uh, ending the drug wars, you know, uh, uh, tra radical transparency in finance, uh, a whole bunch of cool new ideas you'd think millennials would like, at least progressive ones. The idea of calling it a political party was horrible and asking for their subscription was also horrible. They assumed it had to be a scam. They couldn't figure out what scam it was. Uh, but they figured it had to be a scam. Uh, so anyway, we said, shit, uh, launching a party to just appeal to millennials, uh, to boomers, not a good idea. The future is young people. And if this thing won't appeal to millennials, then we should not proceed. So we basically stopped the limited marketing, the test marketing we were doing and said, let's rethink uh, what we're doing and how uh, to do it better and or how to restructure it or respin it or promote it or rebrand it or something to appeal to millennials. And it was at that point in a meeting, Stanton 3 in uh, January 2013, uh, that Jordan Greenhall at the time, now known as Jordan Hall, uh, went to the whiteboard and started drawing a picture. And essentially he drew a fairly steep cone or pyramid or something, triangle probably, uh, as the Emancipation Party. And then he drew uh, broad ramps leading up to it. And he said, what we really need is a softer, less well-defined uh, social movement that uh, uh, articulates some or many of the values of the Emancipation Party, but is not positioned as a political party and requires no contributions and requires no uh, commitment to any action per se. Uh, and it will be a uh, gradual on-ramp that will eventually, that will particularly design to appeal to millennials and will eventually uh, get some of them at least ready to join the Emancipation Party. And that, what I would say, was the mental model of what eventually became Game B, that it was a social movement uh, that incorporated value, a set of values, but wasn't uh, you know, strictly defined and would appeal to young people, but would gradually move them along and eventually become ready for, uh, to be more politically active. Uh, and then we just sort of had a wild conversation at, uh, for a goodly part of the rest of that meeting about, well, what would this thing be, right? And we came up with some, I believe we came up with some principles of that meeting, which would include that it'd be non-hierarchical, uh, that that would be a fundamental value, that it would be network-centric, and that, we, it, that it needed to uh, eventually lead to a social operating system that had long-term metastability, that it could list exist for centuries at least. And interestingly, all three of those things to this day, I believe, are fundamental values in, uh, in uh, neo game B thinking. Um, and it was quite interesting, uh, you know, and re very rapidly became clear that uh, the interest of at least a majority of the participants in this activity, which at that point was probably 25 or 30 people, uh, more of them were interested in the social movement than were in, interested in the party. Uh, but interest in the party continued uh, you know, through the rest, at least until September 2013. Uh, but it was very clear that this concept of this vague social movement is where the energy started to be. And it may well have been in one of those uh, conversations that, uh, that at that time that the concept in a generic sense, not a branded sense, is that game A is the status quo and game B is this new social movement, social operating system, uh, you know, sort of lack of a better term, essentially, and that, that we would position game B uh, as uh, you know, something that, we, that the world would eventually transition to and that game B would explicitly parasitize A to accelerate. Uh, there was certainly a fair amount of accelerationism in that early talking. Uh, and then the, uh, that meeting ended, uh, and the, the meetings ran from Friday evening, where we started with the dinner, to a full, long, intense day on Saturday, and then a half a day on Sunday that was mostly synthesis of what we had cooked on Saturday. And so we went home with this new concept in the air, uh, and we continued to communicate as we always did on Base Camp. Base Camp went all the way back to September 2012, and was the main online community for 
uh, you know, the inner circle of the Emancipation Party and then what became Game B. Uh, and we you know, chattered away as we always did. You know, as I was telling David, there's probably at least 10,000 posts on Basecamp. It might be 100,000. It's a whole bunch. We chattered away way, way too much, probably. Uh, and during this time, this vague idea uh, started getting some legs on it. And that Stanton 4, which happened in April 2013, uh, Jordan Hall, Jordan Greenhall at that point now, Hall, uh, made it, uh, gave a presentation, which uh, I don't believe he was still yet calling it Game B, but it was very much, uh, much more meat on the bones of what we now call Game B. And uh, it also had developed a lot of support and, you know, et cetera. Uh, at the same time, or soon thereafter, again, let's we'll look at the timeline, uh, uh, Thor Muller, uh, made the explicit suggestion that we brand the whole effort Game B. At the, uh, earlier, Game B had been sort of a generic comparison of where we're from, Game A, to where we're going, Game B. But it was thought to be just a, uh, you know, a talking point, internal generic, and not for brand. And Thor was the one, I believe, who decided that it should be branded uh, Game B, proposed that. And there was some discussion, as there always was, and everything that had to do with... Uh, uh, with the community, and but it fixed pretty quickly that people said, okay, uh, let's go with that. Uh, then uh, from that point forward through May and June, uh, we started to ramp up the community, uh, mostly focused on Game B. Uh, in fact, almost all the new people that came in to the inner community were more interested in Game B than they were in the Emancipation Party, though there were still a dozen or so stalwarts including me, still interested principally in the party. Uh, and, the, and then the uh, base camp ca uh, site kept getting busier and busier and busier. And uh, then some fissures started to uh, appear in the community, which are interesting. I don't know if we want to talk about those separately, but maybe we should. So anyway, fissures started to appear, conflict, uh, different views, strongly felt, ugly fights. And over that summer, essentially the... Uh, com the community as a intense operating entity uh, started to unwind. Uh, the last uh, Stanton meeting was Stanton 5 in June of 2013. Uh, we had said there'd be a Stanton 6 in August. It never happened. Uh, you know, we tried some other pivots, but... And then I, I think probably in January 2014, uh, declared the thing to be done. Uh, and I think I use the words, it's time for us to go into spore mode, where we've all learned a lot from each other and have co-created a whole bunch of things, even if we don't agree with them all, agree with each other about everything. So it is now time for us to go back into the world, live our lives, do our thinking, and some of us will probably continue working on Game B-ish things uh, or not. And perhaps in the future, uh, Game B will uh, come back to life. Uh, and interestingly, uh, I don't know, in the last three, four, five months, Game B has come back to life. Uh, very, I mean, I thought it was a, I didn't know what, I don't know. I knew it was possible, but I, if, I, if you'd asked me in January 2014, what's the chances, I would have said less than 50-50 probably, but way higher than zero. And for some reason, uh, it started to rebubble um, uh pretty substantially, and, int and interesting, a lot of it independent of the original Game B people over on Twitter. Uh, if you want to see what they've been up to, uh, search on hashtag, hashtag Game B or just Game B by itself, and you'll find all kinds of people uh, that nobody in the, uh, you know, the Stanton Meetings community had ever, ever known, though they, and, and I think there are a lot of them were driven by uh, listening to podcasts and reading documents and stuff. Uh, so that's, you know, very short mostly short form of the history of Game B. Mm -hmm. uh, though I should say that uh, Jordan, uh, now Hall, had continued to work Game B. In fact, uh, he asked me at the time we went to sport mode, what should he work on? And I had told him Deep Code, which was a, na a name he may have come up with, but was the idea of thinking as deeply as you can about uh, the philosophical principles of what we're doing. And, uh, you know, he's continued to publish under the name Deep Code on Medium uh, and has written a lot of really good things. He then later met uh, two people out where he lives in Southern California, Daniel Schmattenberger and uh, Forrest Landry. And the three of them have done some very good work 
and they have explicitly branded it Game B and have uh, been on lots of podcasts, have written some documents, some blog posts, et cetera, some medium posts, uh, which I, I call this the San Diego interpretation of Game B. And, it is, uh, and while it's the one that's furthest along, I think it's important for people to know that it is not the definitive Game B, and they would be the first to admit uh, that Game B is still very undercooked and underdefined, but they have put some stakes in the ground, and I think they're very useful bits of work that they've done, and I would point people that are interested in learning more about uh, uh, the current thinking of Game B to look at the San Diego interpretation, but realize that it's one interpretation amongst many, and by no means fully defines what Game B could or should be. What was the initial framing of the whole enterprise when you first came into it? So when I arrived at the Stanton meetings, the framing surrounded the shared recognition that I think characterized everybody in the room that civilization was on a dangerous track. Some of us believed the track to be fatal in the near term. And the question was, could we figure out some alternative trajectory that was not only better, but that was accessible from where we were at that time in history, which would have been about 2013. Mm. And do you think everyone who was part of the initial um, project recognized those sort of stakes or recognized it as that kind of civilizationally important project? Uh, I think the degree of recognition varied a lot. Um, I think everybody recognized that there was something concerning about the way civilization presently runs, and maybe everybody in the room would recognize that it was dangerous. But the necessity to do something was uh, a subset of us recognized um, the urgency of it. Mm. And what was achieved, like in the, first, in the first few meetings, what did you feel was achieved? Well, I, I think all of these kinds of projects have the same initial trajectory, which is you have to teach each other to speak your language, to see things that are particularly clear from your vantage point, and you have to let them do the same. And if that fails, then you don't have a project. And if that succeeds, then you can begin to build on the shared understanding. There's no way to skip that phase. and so. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough time together to get much past it, but I think we did a lot of work building a shared understanding and figuring out what direction that we would need to head. And the name Game B, is that a reference to sort of game theory and Game A being the kind of civilization we have at the moment, Game B being a sort of placeholder for something new? Was, was the name chosen because it represented kind of the game theoretic constraints of, of kind of a, a civilization as it is? Well, I, I can't say why the name was chosen. I became aware of it. Jordan gave a presentation at the board and it roughly laid out that we live in something that we would loosely call game A and that we needed to go somewhere called game B. And basically the idea was there was so little content in that name that it could work almost no matter what our priors were about the situation we live in and the fact that we needed to do something new. I do think whether it was intentionally a reference to game theory or not, a, an effort to figure out how civilization functions and what alternative might exist ultimately comes down to your ability to take away all of the layers of meaning that we impose on our system to understand how it does function, which would inherently be analogous to some sort of game, and that a system that we arrived at would also inevitably fit into the same rubric. So really, maybe that name is just evidence of our shared understanding that there was a project and its basic nature would be to look at the rules of our current uh, system and to rework them in such a way that our system would function better. And how would you summarize that? for you, what, what are the failure conditions of game A versus what, what does game A need to be? Or game A, sorry, what does game B need to be? Well, you know, I was brought in because there was an awareness that there was something evolutionary about the whole question and that they needed someone to speak to it rather directly. And the way I would phrase the problem is this. 
we have a tendency as humans to solve problems, and we solve them at all sorts of different scales, whether it's little inventions that reduce the amount of work involved in some sort of uh, objective, or whether we are architecting cities or civilizations or whatever, what have you. And the problem is that when we build these things, in large measure because our history of building such things is pre-Darwinian, we are not aware that we are building an entity that will evolve according to whatever niche space it finds itself in. And so if you look at, for example, the American experiment, the American experiment was architected by highly intelligent people who understood more or less what their objectives were, but they were prior to the origin of species. And so they did not recognize that in constructing this entity, they were also building something that would morph. And whatever their intentions had been at first would be inevitably swallowed by the uh, system of incentives that surrounded the project and that ultimately we would find out what that niche space looked like because the entity they were building would explore it. So I think we've done this time and time again. We've done it politically, we've done it economically, where we've set up a system, we've said what we wanted, and then we discover over time that it turns into something we didn't anticipate. So my contribution to Game B in part was to recognize that this was an evolutionary space and it would therefore uh, either fall victim to evolutionary forces that it was unaware of or take advantage of evolutionary forces that it could be made aware of. Why do you think that name particularly stuck? Uh, again, as I said earlier, uh, if you're unhappy with the status quo, then game B has to be what the status quo isn't. Uh, so better the devil I don't know than the devil I know. And what was the need for the Emancipation Party and then game B? How would you sort of summarize that? Because um, Daniel Schmachtenberger, for example, talks about a kind of self-terminating system. And do you, do you agree with that? Or what would you, how would you frame the need for the whole movement? I would say the Emancipation Party uh, was, le was not that way, really. We thought that the political and economic systems could collapse from their own internal contradictions, uh, but we were not yet focused on bigger questions about, uh, or, you know, that our, uh, is our social operating system literally and heading for suicide? I would say those conversations uh, became part of the uh, discussion in the Game B world, though probably weren't dominant. Uh, like the dominant sense was, was that the world was not good. Uh, not to say particularly the Western world was not good. And in fact, one of the, I think, more succinct uh, statements about Game B was the purpose of Game B is to create a society that we'd actually like to live in and would be proud to leave to our children. And we would say we did not uh, believe that Game A uh, met either of those criteria. So it was really more, more driven by the fact that we did not think uh, the current game A produced the best life for people. Yeah. Who came up with the name Game B? That's an interesting question. Uh, as, as I said earlier, uh, in fact, I actually found on Basecamp uh, that Thor was the first to propose it as the branded name of the movement. Uh, so at one level to say that the person who said we should call what we're doing game B is Thor Muller. However, it's quite possible, in fact, I'm pretty sure it was, that the terms game A and game B is just generics to differentiate between the status quo and uh, the uh, whatever's coming next. Uh, almost certainly we're floating around, in fact, we're certainly floating around in the conversation prior to that. So who, who said the word Game B first? I don't know. Could well have been Jordan. Uh, at least one person thinks it was Brett Weinstein, Stein. Uh, could have been Thor, but not sure. But I, I would give uh, Thor the nod of proposing it as the brand. And what were the specifics that were talked about uh, at the meetings? What, what sort of, because Game B, as you said, it's like a placeholder. It, it, it doesn't actually mean... It just means an alternative to game A. So what were the sort of solid ideas that were being shared at the meetings that... There were long, long, long lists of them which would come and they would go. Uh, unlike the Emancipation Party, which was very disciplined, that worked up to 10 carefully defined uh, reforms which are uh, written about exhaustively on the website, uh, uh, game B was much more amorphous and ideas came and ideas went. 
but as I said, the, the core three were uh, non-hierarchical. Uh, it was very strongly a value that traditional top-down command and control organizations were not about what game B is. Uh, in fact, I would say that in Neo game B terms, that has been uh, resurrected in a stronger form, which is, uh, Jordan likes to say, uh, game B will not manage the complex via the complicated. Complicated meaning things with many highly defined moving parts like a corporation. Uh, second was net uh, centric. Uh, that, again, fits closely with non-hierarchical, that uh, there would be uh, essentially fractal scale of organization and people intercommunicating with each other as peers. In fact, well, this is very some something that unfortunately has not come back in Neo Game B. Uh, we had the name peers, what we called each other. We were all peers, uh, kind of like comrade, right? Uh, so you were a, a Game B peer if you were a member of the inner, you know, the Facebook, or the base camp inner circle. Uh, we talked about self-actualization uh, you know, from Maslow's hierarchy as uh, one of the uh, pole stars for what a good society was. So what is a society that we'd like to live in and leave to our children? Is a society where uh, self-actualization is the highest value, not he who dies with the most toys wins. Where some of the fractures started to come in uh, in Game B uh, was there was one sub-faction that believed changing yourself first uh, was primary. And then there was another faction that believed that creating new institutions, like a better monetary system, uh, better sense-making capabilities, uh, permaculture for food, uh, co-housing. Co-housing was definitely something people were interested in as a, as a peace part towards Game B. Uh, so the uh, building the peace parts and the institutions versus changing as a person uh, were, was a, a fission that started to become clear in May and actually grew and grew and grew until it eventually was probably uh, the main fission that caused the community to kind of set upon itself in a, a not too pleasant way. And so there were people working on the what does it mean to change yourself uh, direction. And then there were people thinking about uh, these various peace parts. And many of them, by this point, not the party anymore, but again, things like co-housing, permaculture, uh, et cetera, uh, or, mo or monetary systems independent of a political party. So from what I understand, there were five meetings at Stanton, and there was a sixth that was planned, but it never went ahead because the sense was that there wasn't enough alignment among the people who were going to be there to make it worthwhile. What was your experience of that time? What, what, what did you feel happened? Well, in some sense, I don't know why we ever expected anything different to occur. So I don't even take it as evidence that we did something wrong um, that Game B came apart. What I think is true is that if you are embarking on a project as ambitious as we were, then you should expect to fail many, many times. And each of those times, it is incumbent on you to figure out what went wrong and to reduce or eliminate the chances of that same failure happening again. It's a classic question of prototyping. And um, in this case, we were prototyping two things. We were trying to um, design a set of rules for civilization that might work going forward, but we also needed to design a set of rules for how we would interact over this question that would work. And it was that second thing um, that came apart on us. I was hard on the Game B community after it came apart because I thought it did not do a great job, in fact it really didn't do any job, of analyzing the, um, the particular breakdown so that were there a game C, game C could profit from the knowledge of what had happened to game B and maybe we'd get to, you know, game LMNOP, who knows, before we would actually figure out how to do it right, but that would be a, an absolutely worthy investment. What happened is we left the space in a situation where it was as likely to suffer the same failure as a new one, and that meant that we weren't likely to make progress. We were basically, in evolutionary terms, waiting for a hopeful monster rather than learning from our mistakes. So what do you think are the key lessons or the key realizations that you think are really important to, to know? Well, I have an overarching one, which uh, is quite live for me at the moment because I'm watching the Game B space um, 
come into public consciousness. And I feel like there is an error, and there's some awareness of this, although I don't think the awareness is what it needs to be. There is some danger of imagining that Game B is or could be an organization or a plan for civilization going forward. I don't think it can be, and I think any attempt to make it either of those things is going to result in, uh, at best, a simple failure, and at worst, something potentially monstrous. So what I'd like to see is the recognition that Game B is actually fairly easy to define. It is, um, the virtue of it is that it is not a highly elaborate description of anything. It is uh, a very basic sketch of something, and that what that sketch ought to do is it ought to set in motion many projects. Once people understand what it is that needs to be achieved in order to save humanity from the trajectory that it's currently on, then in principle, anybody can attempt to describe some mechanism that moves in the direction of game B. And I would point out that this doesn't have to be at the scale of civilization. Really, we have dozens of problems in society. We have problems with uh, health care. We have problems with education. We have problems in our courts. We have problems with homelessness and everything else. And um, what I would like to see, in addition to a large number of groups tackle the question of what a game B might look like across civilization. I would also like to see people tackling the question of, well, what is the game B solution for, uh, let's say, uh, city planning and traffic? What is the game B solution for medical care? All of these things. Each of them is ripe for its own game B solution. And if you, for example, came up with Game B for Education, which is a project I'm actually working on with Heather, um, that that would in and of itself be a major contribution. And if you solved something, if you came up with Game B for Education, that obviously becomes fertile ground. It becomes a place to discuss the larger question of civilization. So Game B is a, uh, a set of parameters um, that describes a superior future state, and it can exist uh, at all scales. In other words, if you had an overarching game B, it would be composed of lots of little game Bs. Um, so I'd like to see the space recognize that the thing to do is not to gather around game B itself and figure out you know, who the voices of game B are, the thing to do is to recognize that Game B is a statement about a design space, and then for people to create initiatives that function inside that design space and attempt to produce either a viable something or other or a kind of knowledge about what doesn't work and why. And you mentioned that there's a basic sketch of what the Game B space needs to look like. Do you want to sketch that out for us? Sure. Well, the first recognition about Game B is that it has to be competitively superior to our system. And this is a, a difficult um, thing to swallow. Once you recognize that even if you described a wonderful future state that would be terrific for people and you presented it, there is no pathway for it to find its way uh, into the structures that make up civilization. In other words, the description is not sufficient. What's worse, if you turn it over to democracy and you allow us to try to vote it into place, it will be so butchered along the way by people who have their personal reasons um, to get in the road that it will be unrecognizable and almost certainly, uh, again, either a failure or worse by the time it makes it into structural space. What we need to do is we need to look for something that has the characteristics of the smartphone, right? So the smartphone took over civilization, not because anybody told us you have to have a smartphone, but because for each of us, there were reasons that we wanted it. It enhanced our lives. And to take two obvious examples, the smartphone camera is now the most popular camera on Earth by orders of magnitude. And it is actually making photography into a much more widespread, uh, I hesitate to even call it a hobby, it's something almost all of us do some fraction of the time. 
Uh, and so the ability to have a highly capable camera and what's more, even a video camera in your pocket just changes the way we live. It means that really at any moment that I want you to see what I'm seeing, I can capture it and I can send it to you uh, instantly, really. So that's a remarkable capacity. Likewise, the ability to drop into almost any city on earth and find a location that I want to be and dead reckon my way there with the help of a navigation device, these are spectacular characteristics. So those sorts of things caused us all to embrace this technology. Now, unfortunately, the underlying businesses that make the phone and that populate it with apps, those businesses are overwhelmingly game A entities. And so unfortunately, it's a Faustian bargain. And this device that makes us so marvelously capable is now hell-bent on addicting us to counterproductive behaviors and everything else. So it's not as if the cell phone is a game B device. But what it is, is a demonstration that if something empowers you enough, people will embrace it without having to be told that they need to embrace it or without anybody being, um, without anybody voting it into, into existence. It just simply takes over by virtue of competitive superiority. So characteristic one of game B is that it is competitively superior so that people will embrace it, not because we tell them to, but because they know it's good for them to, to participate. Something like that can sweep over civilization relatively easily. The second characteristic is really, it comes in two forms. The structure has to at least be robust, and maybe at first that's all it could be. But ultimately, the game B structure has to be anti-fragile. That is to say that challenge causes it to become stronger rather than weaker. And this is a characteristic of uh, most evolutionary systems. So um, it has to have um, that characteristic or it won't persist through its early phases. Ultimately, it has to be what we would call an evolutionarily stable strategy. An evolutionarily stable strategy is a strategy that is not uh, displaceable by alternatives. So in other words, if some parasitic strategy or some competitive strategy emerges and challenges a game B structure, the game B structure has to be robust and it has to, um, to defeat it. So this is an analog of the competitive ability to sweep civilization and the ability to remain in place. Um, those two things go together. And then the last set of characteristics uh, have to do with what game B would achieve. And I would claim that there are a set of values that almost any person who is um, not authoritarian minded would agree are highly desirable in, uh, in a society. So things like fairness, security, um, protection from catastrophic risk, these sorts of things are uh, relatively easy to get people to agree to. And I've tried this experiment many times. I've asked rooms full of people I don't know how they feel about these things. And what you discover is that we all really agree on the list of things that civilization should accomplish. Um, what we disagree over is an analysis of where we stand in that project, how good our society is at, for example, um, giving people uh, fair access to the market. Um, and we disagree on the priority, the ordering of these things that we would dictate. In other words, some people uh, would prioritize safety um, over freedom, and others would prioritize freedom over safety. And both of those are defensible positions, so we don't necessarily expect everyone to agree on them. But the fact that the list of things that society that a good society would accomplish is relatively easy to get agreement on is very hopeful um, because it means we can paint with a broad brush what we are trying to accomplish um, with relative ease. And there's another thing that works in our favor here, which is that in a complex system, in a complex system with an objective, right? So there are complex systems like weather in which there is no objective, but in a complex system with an objective like society, um, there are uh, automatically diminishing returns with, with respect to each of the objectives um, that can be labeled. 
And what that means is that you can achieve a large fraction of uh, an objective, but the closer you try to get to perfection with respect to it, the larger the costs in terms of other values. So what this means is that if we can agree on the list of things that uh, a game B world would achieve, and we can agree that we don't want 100% on any of them, but what we want is the lion's share of all of them, we can have that. And you know, the folks who prefer safety uh, over uh, liberty can probably have their life biased in that direction, and those who prefer liberty over safety could probably have their lives biased in the direction they prefer, and there wouldn't have to be a, an important conflict uh, about those things because everybody would get um, the majority of everything that they were looking for. And with the initial um, Game B community, what were the failure points of that particular organization. I've spoken to a few people and they've said that there was a big split around the idea of kind of personal growth and uh, systems change or institutions. Is that is that true? Is that what you saw play out? Uh, I did see it play out. I'm not sure I um, agree on what the question is because maybe I just simply fall out with the systems folks. But I believe that the spiritual dimension is important, but I believe that it is something, it is an outgrowth of a system that is actually well enough architected to free you to explore that. And exploring it in the space of design is uh, nonsensical. It is putting the cart before the horse, as it were. So I'm very much interested in seeing a world that addresses that problem. I'm not so sure that Game B discussions themselves need to address that problem, and in fact, I gave a talk many years ago on what I called the personal responsibility vortex. And the personal responsibility vortex was about the wrong-headed idea that one fixes the world through behaving in a personally responsible way that will then scale up. And in fact, the exact opposite is true. If you hold people to live the values that they would like to see fit civilization, then the best people will be hobbled by their level of obligation to, for example, sustainability, and they will have very little impact on the way the world comes to look. And those who pay no attention to sustainability will have lots of extra resource and freedom with which to shape the world to their objectives. So if you want to see the world look a particular way, holding people to that exact standard in the moment is seems right, but the counterintuitive truth is it's dead wrong and will be counterproductive. But, but you did see that, that split play out in terms of the direction or the, the would, would you agree that that was the, the major split between the two different camps within Game B when it split? Well, I certainly saw that conflict, and I guess I would say one has to figure out how, at the moment that that split emerges, and it's not the last time it will be seen in any space that aspires to this sort of thing, it's likely to be seen. But at the point you have those two camps, the obvious thing to do is to divide them and say, look, you can't solve the systemic issue by, you know, some sort of personal exploration. It doesn't invalidate personal exploration. Personal exploration is wonderful, but if you want to go do that, then that's either a tax on the systems discussion, right, uh, or it belongs separated from it. So why don't you do that? And, you know, I'd be perfectly happy to see people who were interested in that, maybe even primarily interested in that, but also have an interest in the systems discussion to come participate in a systems discussion. But the systems discussion is not the place for that exploration. It may be a place to discuss how you would make civilization hospitable to such explorations. But as I've said elsewhere, in order to have a compassionate society, you have to do a dispassionate analysis of the various problems that prevent it so that you can address them. And so I think this is counterintuitive to people I know it is, but when you hear people being dispassionate, it is not a failure of their emotional structure. It is a proper corralling of that structure so it doesn't get in the road of creating a system that in the long term fosters exactly the thing that those who are focused on personal growth would like to see. 
Yeah, what do you think were some of the, the reasons you, you said that it kind of collapsed or it fell apart? Could you, could you talk a bit more about what the tensions were within the community and why you think that happened? In my view, and I would say this is not canonical, just my view, is there were two fissions uh, that were, are not quite entirely orthogonal with each other, but are different. There was, let's call it the institutions or tools first faction and the change yourself faction. And then there was an overlay of what I'd call woo versus anti-woo. Woo meaning uh, uh, belief in the uh, supernatural, uh, or what I would say, Bullshit, right? Uh, and there were definitely a faction who, especially, I think they were all on the personal change side, who uh, really got into what I would call woo, new agery, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, but not all the personal change people were of that sort. Many of them were, you know, uh, personal change in other ways. Um, but, and, and I think the final threshold which caused the death throes were a small group of people uh, started to proclaim, or at least were perceived to be proclaiming, and this may or may not actually have happened, you know, the, the, the perception might not have been accurate, or it may have been so hazy, it's hard to tell, that some form of woo should become mandatory. And that would be utterly unacceptable to uh, both the anti-woo and the institutional faction. And I would say of the anti-wooers, yo is number one. Uh, you know, when I, one of my, you explain what that means, that some form of woo, woo would become meaning, manda mandatory. Yeah, that you have to accept, for instance, that there's a cosmic consciousness, right? Uh, I go, I don't believe in that goddamn cosmic consciousness till you can prove it, right? Uh, one of my favorite quotes that I like to use that I wrote is, when I hear the word metaphysics, I reach for my pistol. Uh, I am a uh, hardcore scientific realist. I don't believe shit unless there's evidence, right? On the other hand, I don't rule things out either. I say, ah, oh, yeah, old Yahweh may actually exist. I think it's incredibly improbable, uh, but until someone can present uh, evidence that Yahweh exists that's independently reproducible, uh, I am not going to believe in Yahweh, right? Nor am I going to believe in cosmic consciousnesses or any of that kind of horseshit. Uh, but can you unpack what that means that some people wanted that to be compulsory? Yeah. There was what did that look like and who was that uh, so, involved? So again, uh, uh, there was at least a sense, and again, maybe we overreacted, that there was a small number of people uh, who were proposing that Game B should include a metaphysical statement about reality beyond scientific realism. I guess that's the way to say it. You know, let's say, for instance, that there is a cosmic consciousness. So why did Staunton 6 not happen? I think the, the decohesion of the community across all these various lines, uh, including people interested in the party still, which there were still a few, uh, those interested in institution building, those interested in personal change, those interested in woo metaphysics, uh, and and people started getting mad at each other, you know, for promoting their point of view. And the system decohered, I think is the best way to, to describe it. And at that point, we said, well, you know, no point in bringing people together so we can just have a fight. And so, so it never happened. When the initial sort of Stanton uh, meeting stopped, I know Jim said that, that it was basically going into spore mode, that a lot of the original people went off and did their own projects and, it seems that those spores, or at least the kind of the meme of Game B is now getting a lot more attention. There's like Facebook groups, it's got some presence on Twitter, it's sort of growing up. Uh, one, did, has that surprised you at all? And two, actually just one, has that surprised what, what do you make of the, the, the kind of the, the resurgence of interest in this area? Well, I see it as a result of a couple of different things. And one of them, uh, I, I had some involvement in. I mentioned Game B uh, at some length on Joe Rogan's podcast, and I know that there was a flurry of interest that came from that. So in one way, it can't surprise me too much because I was sort of hoping to see it and uh, went about talking about it publicly. Now, even at the point that I was talking about it on Joe Rogan's program, there was already a kind of organic, I think slower growing uh, movement on Facebook and elsewhere. I have been reluctant about participating in it for various reasons, um, but nonetheless, I'm not surprised that something has emerged. I'm a little bit startled by the way I hear Game B discussed, and I feel like 
the energy that one of the things that worked in our favor in the Game B discussion was the fact that we were nobody to anyone, right? This was an invisible discussion. And because it was an invisible discussion, we had the capacity to explore down different avenues without worrying so much about what it meant. And now that there is sort of a public awareness in certain circles about Game B and Stanton and all of these things, I think there's a tremendous danger of um, the idea being, you know, captured would be the worst way it could fail. The more likely way is it could um, evolve in some direction that is counterproductive. Do you want us to talk a bit more about that? <laughs> it is very difficult to distinguish between people who earnestly believe something and espouse it because of their earnest belief and people who discover that espousing that belief puts them ahead. And it is 100% inevitable that people who see the Game B discussion as an opportunity will uh, find their way there and will say the kinds of things that get people to nod along and that that thing, that momentum, can take a movement that is highly um, generative and can swamp it with something else. And I really don't have any interest in participating in the something else. The question is, we actually faced this question at the end of the Stanton meetings, which was there was a desire to increase the size of the discussion, which I think everybody agreed was a good idea. But there was this sort of rush to bring people in, and I tried to caution at the time that a single error is very costly. So you may bring in 10 generative people. There may be diminishing returns on your generative people. In other words, a lot of what they bring to the table may already be in the room. Um, but one mistake, right? One bad actor or one person who is motivated by what I would call social truth rather than analytical truth can uh, cause tremendous havoc. And so I, I thought we were making an error in a couple of different ways. One, I thought that the idea that the organization moved from being the Emancipation Party into being Game B, that turned out to be an error pretty clearly. Um, Game B is not an organization. It should never be an organization. And the Emancipation Party rightly was. It made sense as one. Um, so there should have been a relationship between those two things. And what I'm getting at is instead of doing what we did, which was decide that the Emancipation Party was a non-starter, I think 2016, the election in the US and what you saw in uh, Britain with Brexit in 2016 tells us that actually there was room for some sort of an alternative party. And if the Emancipation Party had stuck it out from 2013, um, who knows what might have happened. But um, the Emancipation Party, at the point that we decided it was not the right moment in history for the Emancipation Party, should have become a sub-project of whatever the organization was functioning towards a Game B objective. That's not what we did. We decided the Emancipation Party was no more. We decided that this was Game B, which was an error. Um, and um, then we decided to increase who was in the room, which took whatever tensions were already there, be they tensions between the spiritual and the systematic or, or whatever, um, and it made them worse. So one thing I would advise anybody attempting to build a Game B entity is to figure out how to insulate things that are functional from things whose impact you don't yet know. So um, in other words, some capacity to go in reverse um, or to change direction or some isolate that can be preserved if your decision that you've just made turns out to have been uh, a mistake. 
um, and we didn't we didn't do that. We um, we just simply decided the organization should grow, and um, that would have been fatal if nothing else was. And you mentioned coherence as one lesson that that maybe can be learnt from it. What do you think the other lessons are, especially now that there's a kind of resurgence of interest in the whole game B space? What yeah. What, what should people take on board? Yeah, coherence for sure. And second, and this would be perhaps controversial, uh, is that uh, institutions do matter and that Neo Game B, once it decides to get beyond being a talk shop, should uh, build some early institutions uh, on how to do things, uh, you know, a justice system, which we eventually did build in late Game B uh, called the Ad Hoc Justice Process. And then when there was a call to build a formal justice process, it never got done. Uh, but uh, some preliminary institutions, but that are known to be uh, contingent and that they're not well formed yet and that they are subject to amendments. So it needs to have an amendment meta process. So I would strongly suggest at some point uh, that a line be drawn, at least a minimal set of bootstrap institutions uh, come into existence. Uh, second, third, that the uh, onboarding process uh, be more rigorous, or at least, you know, they're fairly rigorous uh, in game B, but that it be tuned for coherence rather than ex uh, too much exploration. Or I I'll take that back, a balance between coherence and exploration. Uh, game B, late game B was too much exploration, not enough coherence. Hmm. And you also said earlier on that you think there's a danger in coherence. Yes. I mean, you know, what is ultimate coherence? A cult, right? Or a, a dictatorship. Uh, so I see that uh, coherence is hugely important, but I would say absolute coherence, i.e. lack of coherent pluralism, is even worse than no coherence. Or, you know, like you could argue whether North Korea is worse than anarchy. I don't know. They both suck, right? And that's the, you know, North Korea, extreme coherence, Pure anarchy, no coherence. And so where you want to be is somewhere in the middle uh, with a thoughtful, nuanced balance of where you are. And you know, make it, this is the coherent core. We all agree we believe this. Or if we don't, we're not part. And an explicit statement that anything that's not in the core is pluralistic. Until, there, until through some institutional process, we may find some new things we want to add to the core. We also, through an institutional process, may want to take some things out of the core. Spore mode. So spore mode refers to uh, mushrooms. Uh, you know, the, the real mushroom lives underground or in rotten wood, etc. And then the so-called fruiting body is the thing that we see and that we eat. And typically it grows up and then it fruits, which are typically spores, which are tiny, tiny, tiny little seeds, which often get blown by the wind a long way. And mushroom spores can often exist for many, many years if the conditions aren't right before they sprout. And when the conditions are right, then they sprout and a new mushroom grows. So that was uh, the model I decided to use sort of at the end of active game B. And we're going into spore mode. Everyone is going to, dis we're going to disperse our spores, i.e. our people out into the world and they'll continue to do whatever it is they do. And perhaps in a, a different time, in a different climate, and as the world's changed and as things have been learned, some of those spores will take root again and grow new mushrooms. Mm. And so in the last few months, that seems to be happening. Do you want to yeah. tell us what's, what's going on now? Uh, uh, truthfully, I can't even tell you for sure. But we've noticed a tremendous uh, upsurge uh, in interest in Game B uh, in... I guess, what are we in October? So it was certainly happening in July, June, July. I haven't truthfully tracked back the traffic. Uh, I think some of it was some of the podcasts that have been done. You know, Jordan uh, and uh, Daniel Schmattenberger have been on podcasts. I was on a few podcasts. I think my own interviews of Jordan and Daniel may have helped. But something happened in that June, July time frame. And uh, Game B seems to be you know, spreading and groups of people we don't know or weren't connected to are doing really good work, uh, particularly the Twitter uh, Game B. I was talking to Jordan about that uh, a couple days ago, and I said, we didn't know any of those people. They had somehow you know, come upon all of our various works and been, and been actively 
uh, working them, and they've created these very interesting online Google Docs, which point to all kinds of references and take extracts from uh, podcasts and essays and things, and it's really amazing. It's very Game B-ish, right? Non-hierarchical, network-centric, and maybe it's metastable and lasts a long time, we'll see. Uh, so there's a community on uh, Twitter. Uh, there's a community, a community with hashtag Game B's, probably the easiest way to find them. And there's a very rapidly growing community on Facebook in the, the Facebook group Game B. And make sure you answer the three questions, damn it, if you apply for membership, because you will not be let in if you don't answer the three questions. And what do you make of the, this current upsurge? Did it take you by surprise or what, what, what are you seeing? What, what, what do you think it, it what, how does it look to you? Ah, that's a very excellent question. Now, surprise about any given time, yes, right? Uh, Because one of the things we learn from a complexity systems perspective is the trajectory of a complex system is exceedingly difficult uh, to predict. However, you may be able to predict uh, some averages across ensembles of trajectories. And so when we put game B into spore mode, I might have said there was a 50% chance it would come back to life someday, right? Uh, but when, I had no clue. And the fact that it seemed to have come back to life this summer, I would not have predicted in advance. I mean, that's a typical complex system story. Phase transitions, as we call them, are typically unpredictable. And so a phase transition seems to have occurred, and it's now uh, self-generating and probably growing with an exponential, uh, with some exponent greater than one, uh, which means if you wait long enough, it'll conquer the whole world. But whether how long that uh, exponent will remain greater than one, I don't know. But it's actually quite interesting. And, and the fact that I like it about it is that it is very game B. It's uh, bottoms up, uh, nobody dictating what game B is, uh, people kind of collectively uh, creating it. Though, as I said earlier, I do believe at some point they need to build some institutional structures in there to keep the problem of uh, the previous problem of decoherence from occurring. Mm. And I mean, you mentioned the names Jordan and Daniel, and so a lot of the energy at the moment is around that particular kind of conception of game B. Yeah, I think, um, the, yeah, I think it's fair to say that. What do you make of that? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that the most actual work that has been done on game B since 2014 has been done by what I call the San Diego uh, configuration, the San Diego group, uh, which is uh, Jordan uh, Hall, uh, Daniel Schmattenberger, uh, uh, Forrest, what the hell's his name? Forrest, Forrest, Landry. Forrest Landry, and various and sundry other folks, uh, and they've done some very good work. Uh, Forrest has done some really interesting work on how to run organizations without rigid hierarchies, uh, how to go from culture to operating entities and back again. Where does consensus work? Where do other forms of uh, things work? Daniel's done some great exploration. He hasn't come to any answers, but he's put some very significant flags out on what a new economics might look like. Uh, Jordan's done a lot of uh, good theoretical work on what does this all mean from a larger perspective. Uh, And so I say they've done a a really good body of work. However, they'll be the first to admit uh, they have done nothing like the definitive answer, what is game B? They essentially put out a series of piece parts and partial uh, you know, philosophical perspectives, but there's still a tremendous amount to be done. And I will say they've been exemplary in not claiming that they have defined game B. They've been very upfront about, it. we've done our piece, other people have to do theirs. Now, one thing that I would disagree with them some is their approach, is they seem to be consciously taking a let's go slow and keep it somewhat private for now perspective. Uh, you know, you know I, I brought forth the, the quote that the perfect, the, you know, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And I would say our world is in sufficient need for more good uh, that my own biases, and they are biases, I have no idea if I'm right, is to move things into the world sooner where they're critiqued by other people and where they're tried. You know, and I think that's you know, my own philosophy of game B, that it is very experimental and exploratory. We don't know, and trying to trying to can all the answers in advance is a fool's errand. Uh, by the time you spent ten years doing it, you're going to then go out in the real world and find out eighty percent of it was wrong. And to my mind, at least, and again, it's a different approach than uh, than the San Diego crew. Uh, I'd say, you know, let's take a reasonable, rough set of ideas. Uh, you know, build a minimum viable product, launch it, maybe fail, uh, tune it, uh, relaunch it. 
And to my mind, that's a better way to explore uh, a vast space that uh, that is you know, really difficult to parse in advance until you actually engage the world. One of the lessons that I, I try to teach my children is that you need to develop a deep relationship with the idea of prototyping. That prototyping is the way you learn to accomplish something you do not have, know how to do. And the mythology around the construction of things does not pay nearly enough attention to prototyping. So if we look at the United States as a project, we might come to the conclusion that it is a failed project. If we look at it as a prototype, then we can say, well, this was actually a wildly successful prototype that eventually showed what about the design wasn't quite right. It is definitely time for a 2.0 version of something. Um, what's more, it has to be a 2.0 version of something that does not require uh, the collapse of what is. Somehow we have to seamlessly move from our prototype to something that is more capable and stable um, without this one coming apart. That's why I make this point about competitive superiority and sweeping across civilization without having to win power and change the structures uh, in some sort of um, more direct way. Um, I guess one final point I would make is I think there's a tension that I haven't, I'm sure it's been described in many places, but I haven't seen it um, described with full breadth anywhere, which is that those things which are the most capable are always fragile. Okay? To the extent that we wish to have conversations that can reach greater heights, those conversations are absolutely vulnerable to being disrupted by anybody who doesn't want them to happen, right? So high capacity and vulnerability go together in a way that's n not how we imagine it. Typically, we think that something that is highly capable is also very strong rather than very vulnerable. What we're talking about is a discussion in which we are able to see what might be possible for civilization and how it might be architected to be anti-fragile, and evolutionarily stable in the end, but that discussion itself will be fragile. It has to be protected, and protected from all kinds of things that threaten it, which means things like uh, naivete, it has to be protected from bad actors, it has to be protected from people who are looking to use it as an av avenue to propel themselves somewhere. Um, all of these things threaten it, and they all necessitate that you be able to take a conversation that's functional and shield it, right? Shield it from anything which challenges it so that it can wrestle with things and it can make errors and it can fall down and get back up again rather than suffer whatever fate it would suffer if just left to the, um, the whims of the populace. Hmm. This feels like a very natural segue into the intellectual dark web conversation which we could also maybe see as a prototype. Ah, absolutely. Because um, one, one last point on this that I wanted to raise, it's something that references something that you and Eric talked about in the Rubin Report, where you talked about how truth cannot survive the encounter with market forces, which I think is a really valuable frame to look at the sort of game A, game B conversation, especially because I, I saw in one of the, in the game B Facebook group, someone said, well, what is, what is game B journalism? And I thought about that for a while, like that's my, my area of interest, interest. And I thought, well, at its best, journalism is game B. Mm -hmm. has to be. In the same way that academia is game B. And so if you realize that, it's like, that they have to be, like game B, well, journalism should be, about pure, like true, truly ethical information. So if you have a, any kind of allegation, you've got to put it to the person, get their response. You're supposed to get all the views of everyone before doing your story. So, it's, so that, as a case study, journalism and academia, why are they failing, is probably as good a way as any to kind of look at, okay, what are, what are, the, what are the factors that are making game, well, a game, suppose a game B enterprise, what, what are the game A factors that are making them fail? So 
I think another way to look at this is that there are many things that exist where we increasingly only know their pathological form. Mm -hmm. And it is the conflation of the pathological form with the form itself that is so confusing. So the fact that there is almost no Game B journalism means that we understand journal journalism to be this malformed, uh, arbitrary, uh, untruthful dispenser of information. Um, but you're right. Journalism itself would be a Game B enterprise, right? You report what's true in spite of its implications for you personally. That's the very definition of a Game B enterprise. Likewise, uh, education and science. These are not about discovering things that are good for you or profitable. These are about discovering things that are true and teaching people how to think about them. They would inherently be Game B versions. Uh, medicine, I mean, even you know, as much as the Hippocratic Oath may be uh, a little bit antiquated at this point, it does reveal that at some level there was an understanding about what medicine's purpose was. Do we really doubt that the purpose of modern medicine is to make a profit for those who make the drugs and dispense the materials and all of the other enterprises within that scope? It's very purpose has changed and it does a tremendous amount of harm to people in the moment because you can't have two purposes as your top priority. So yes, game B should something figure out how to bring us to such a world. We will discover that many of the forms that we've seen distorted are really um, permutations of something honorable that has been lost. So one of my concerns about the way the game B conversation is unfolding is that it is collapsing all of the conversations that might ultimately produce their own um, prototype into one conversation. And I don't see any way that that can end well. And we talked about this a little bit uh, during the Stanton meetings. Uh, I raised the question about whether or not we were the only discussion of this kind, or whether there were a hundred such rooms or a thousand. And it was clear to me, and I think many others, that it would have been wonderful had there been many such discussions, because only one of them has to work. The point of a game B is not for us to produce a world that will work, it's for somebody to accomplish it. And in some ways, uh, best possible outcome for any individual is for somebody else to figure out how to get us there, because it really um, takes the pressure off and it means you get to have the advantages of that wonderful world on the far side. Um, but I think one of the things that we have learned in that discussion and then us all fanning out from it is that there aren't a lot of such conversations and that there's actually probably a reason for that, which is that the way we are connected together today, there is a strong tendency for people who are like-minded enough to have thought their way down that road to some degree to coalesce into one discussion. And that tendency to coalesce into one discussion means that the chances of multiple uh, variations on that theme resulting in one of them surviving and beating the odds is greatly reduced. So. Um, I am a little concerned, you know, there are lots of people who are now in this Game B space who are not at the Stanton meetings. And um, what concerns me is, I mean, people like Jamie Wheel and Daniel Schmachtenberger, is that instead of us all being in one conversation, wouldn't we be better off if those were separate nodes? And I mean, not saying that we shouldn't be talking to each other, but the idea that it is all one discussion looking for one solution um, just reduces the odds of success uh, all the more. Isn't there a paradox then in that the more we talk about it, the more it becomes one discussion? So isn't talking about it kind of feeding that trend towards it being one, one conversation? Um, you know, uh, Eric and I and Heather and I have a kind of mode that we go into when we discuss something that is very uncertain and on which something important rests. And it involves figuring out how to isolate your beliefs so that you can discuss them without them being altered, 
right? So in other words, there's some sort of a formalization in discussion about, all right, I'm gonna lock down what I believe about this topic. You lock down what you believe about this topic. Then we're gonna meet and we're gonna discuss whether or not those are the same beliefs. If we turn out to have the same belief, then okay, that gives us increased confidence that there's probably something true about that belief. If we find out that we're actually in different places when we meet in the middle, then we step very carefully because at least having formalized our belief before our position moves allows us to say, okay, I made a jump, right? That means if it turns out that down the road that jump was counterproductive, I can probably unmake that jump. I can remember what it was like to think that other thing beforehand. Whereas the natural tendency in informal conversation is for your position to move as you are persuaded. And unfortunately, many people are unduly persuaded by somebody else's intensity of belief. So it's a sort of a cultivated skill that you will avoid being persuaded by the fact that somebody that you like is very convinced of something. Um, so what I would argue is that we have to have conversations, right? I mean, those people that we were discussing are connected socially. They will have discussions. And it is natural for those discussions to have some overlap with this territory. But maybe there needs to be some formalization around how to make sure that the conversations don't synonymize or average or whatever it is that they will tend to do so that their independence from each other can be utilized. You know, you know, in a functional academy, this would be the way different laboratories studying the same question would function. It would be the way different schools of thought behaved. There would be interaction between them, but there would also be enough insulation that we could sort of track the development of what happened. And the question of spore mode that uh, Jim Rutt raised, whether at the end of the Stanton meetings, the game B entity dispersed to the wind and the independent nodes in that discussion um, were germinating the ideas. There's some potential truth in that, but I'm concerned that that's not really what happened. And that because the idea of game B reawakened in uh, the age of social media and YouTube, that what we have is an idea loosely defined that um, because there is a lot of energy around the idea of living in the better world that is loosely proposed in that definition, um, that the conversation is now developing in a space that not only has no proper rule set, but is also has no evolutionary history. We don't know that discussions like this are productive. Frankly, we don't know and I think have strong reason to believe that we're the founding fathers to have built the prototype that is the American experiment in the social media age that it would not have worked well. Um, so I think we need to be very careful about um, what it means the spore mode is a very loose description of what happened and um, what, as those spores germinated and were again in contact with each other through some network whose rules we don't understand, um, whether that doesn't immediate, immediately challenge the idea that they were spores and that they might uh, grow apart into unique plants. So what's your concern with the conversation as it exists now in the social media age? Well, I have to say I'm a little bit at a disadvantage talking about the conversation uh, as it's actually happening because I have stayed out of it. And I've stayed out of it for some very intentional reasons and then some other reasons that were just a happenstance. The intentional reason is that I have seen the power of beliefs persuade people of fictions and I know this process to be very difficult to resist if you were in those conversations day in and day out. So they kind of, your belief system gets chiseled away at just by virtue of the fact that lots of people are repeating something that you just lose the ability to, to protect. So I've stayed out of it in part because I don't think the conversation is productive enough to justify that hazard. The independence of thought is um, valuable enough to be worth 
staying out. And then, of course, there's the circumstances that unfolded around uh, my exit from Evergreen, which made Facebook in particular an almost impossible place for me to tolerate. So um, I had been a user of Facebook, not I was never enthusiastic about it, but I had been a user of Facebook. And at the point that Evergreen came apart, I uh, stepped away from it. And I really haven't been able to go back just by virtue of what sort of discussion it is. Um, so I can't speak to the particulars of the discussion, but I can say in general, a large freeform discussion um, in which people uh, gather as a result of uh, the appeal of some concept, those discussions are not likely to be highly fruitful because the, the curation that has to go on at the door in order to create one of these highly generative but fragile conversations needs to be better than that. But if we define freedom in terms of how much liberty you actually have that you can act upon, right, that you can engage in the real world, then we will discover a couple of things. One is that um, if you have achieved great deals of realized freedom, that you have probably achieved all of the other goals and balanced them in a way um, that is desirable. What, what are your biggest takeaways when you look back on that time and you sort of look at where we're at now? What, what are your biggest takeaways? What do you look back and think? I think we were damn prescient uh, that things would get worse, which they certainly have. Uh, we were a little prescient about uh, the fact that we we're rapidly approaching the limits of the ecosystem. But I think that was one area where we were not as prescient as we could have been. Uh, uh, and so that, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I think that we, it highlights to me the tremendous failure of organizational design and dynamics above all else. And that's why I think the Forrest Landry work may well be critical to Neo Game B succeeding or failing, uh, or if not his, then somebody else's. But I should say, and this is very important, uh, that in these high dimensional complex systems, you cannot say in advance whether X will work. You've got to take an experimentalist perspective. You've got to try it, and I know he believes this as well. He wants to try it on two groups, uh, relatively small, then larger groups, et cetera. So all these tools and techniques, the piece parts for which we will build game B, have got to all be uh, taken from an, an empirical, experimental perspective, tried, and see if they work. And if they do, then that we vet that they are suitable for at least the early stages of game B. Maybe it turns out they're only good for up to 2,500 people, then you have to rethink it. So I would strongly suggest to those interested in game B, stay light on your feet. Uh, don't make over strong commitments to anything. Uh, when things stop working, pitch them and try something else. Mm. Yeah, I think that's kind of my last question is what advice would you have for people just discovering this kind of space or the Neo game B? Where, where did it go from here? Oh, that's an excellent question. You know, there's, I think, probably a couple of different directions. One is because of the nature of the foundations of Game B, it will be a talking shop forever. There will be people bloviating about various and sundry Game B related topics, uh, both uh, allegedly the uh, practical and others purely theoretical forever. That's, it, it's built into the DNA. And if you want to bloviate, you can find fellow bloviators uh, till, till the cows come home. On the other hand, uh, I would suggest it's time for more doers to show up. And particularly on Twitter game B, uh, there are people now pounding the table, let's do something, let's do something. Uh, and for people who like to do things, I'd suggest uh, find the other doers and go do something. And realize it ain't gonna be perfect the first time out of the, out of the shoot. Uh, and, and even you know, just experiment with the piece parts. You don't like, the, you don't like public schools, which is one of the, uh, I think, relatively consistent beliefs in the game B community. Uh, you know, then build a charter school in your community and use your ideas, see how they work, uh, and make sure and see if they're and make sure they're informed with game B ethos. And if it works, report back. Uh, you know, that's I think the key part. Do experiments, report back, and report your failures and your successes. Yeah, what are I mean? You just gave the example of education here. What are the other sort of solid ideas, solid concrete ideas that came out of this, or things that needed to be solved, whether they were 
uh, actually, you know, frankly, did we do anything useful on them? No. But did we talk about a lot about them? Yes. Well, how to, how to run and how to build and run an organization? We identified that as absolutely critical. Uh, education, health, and distinguishing that from health care, right? We, in the United States, way too much uh, talk about health care when really what we want is health. And that includes eating good food, uh, exercising uh, plenty, you know, not being annoyed by being overstressed by your damn smartphone uh, and lots and lots of things. So uh, taking a holistic perspective on health was uh, clearly a, a theme. Um, Let's see, I think out. Uh, and re- somewhat related to health, was it was always a strong interest in uh, food and uh, clean food, local food, uh, you know, food that could be, you know, that was not overly refined, but was interesting and good and probably built, you know, cr- created by people you already knew. Uh, housing was a big one that said there was a, a foray into trying to understand co housing. And we had a person, Lydia Lawrenson, who actually had been the manager of a couple of co-housing projects. She was a huge and wonderful resource, but that stimulated uh, a big conversation. Uh, the sharing economy. We talked a lot about the sharing economy in 2013, a little bit prescient there. Things like um, uh, tool libraries and perhaps joint ownership of cars and uh, things of that ilk. Again, to make people's lives less economically intensive and less environmentally intensive. Does everybody need a car? Fuck no. You just need N cars across N people, M people, for X missions, right? And it's probably a shitload less than the typical American has, who has, you know, 2.7 cars and probably needs 1.1 on average. Maybe less than that. Can you consider how many, you know, you drive your car to work and it sits there eight day, eight hours. That's crazy, right? Uh, so we talked about a lot of these uh, kinds of things. Um, uh, one that's arisen in Neo Game B. And uh, in the next episode of the Jim Rutt Show, uh, Jordan and I go over a fairly long list of these things. Uh, one of them is parenting. I think there's become a lot of interest in uh, you know, preschool age children. How do the parents uh, and the children interact correctly? What is the right kind of home life for children? Uh, you know, how, do we, how do we help make sure that Game B children are uh, well balanced, joyful, productive, uh, non neurotic, etc. So I think that's an area there's a lot of interest in right now. Um, you know, again, uh, the other one that's new since uh, Game B 1.0, though we had kind of a hazy vision of it, is what's called sense making. Uh, this is uh, a key interest of uh, a community that came right before Neo Game B uh, called Rally Point Alpha, which you can check out on Facebook, the Rally Point Alpha group, which was triggered by an essay by Jordan and has tried to dedicate itself to understand how uh, networked individuals can make sense of the world in a powerful fashion. Uh, are we currently doing it? No. Uh, and, and there needs to be more things, including perhaps better tools. Uh, but sense-making is certainly uh, a category of great interest in the uh, Neo Game B world. And uh, something we share with the, all the way back to the Emancipation Party uh, is a strong interest in rethinking economics. Uh, the monetary system, banking, uh, investment, uh, uh, rivalrous versus non-rivalrous economics, those have been themes consistent all the way through. And I would particularly point people to Daniel Schmattenberger's uh, essays that are pointing the way towards what a new economics might be. I guess I'll just reiterate one more time that uh, for game B to be real, at some point it has to make the transition from talk to action. And uh, uh, we can talk till the cows come home, but it's action that really changes the world. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.